uh, gone five o'clock. Yep. Got it. Yeah. Okay. So, okay. John, you are going to lead today, no? Um, yes, I, I shall do that. Okay. Well, welcome everybody, and um, thank you for coming. And really looking forward to this. Um, Steve, who I'm sure most of you have known for a long time, has um, had a long history of involvement with the VSM. Does some of the best pictures, which uh, I'm sure are going to make up um, a lot of this, uh, a lot of this talk, and a very deep understanding of the model, which um, we, we 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 meet yeah. our, on a weekly basis, and um, and that continues to impress me. So. Um, so yeah, Steve's uh, now an independent consultant, used to be a uh, principal scientist at BT. Is that right, Steve? Or... Yeah, something like that, John. Yeah, so, yeah, so, <laughs> yeah, yeah. A very, uh, very, very, very impressive title. And that now an independent consultant working um, with a VSM in various ways, which he's going to talk about today. So over to you, Steve. <laughs> it's all yours. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, John. Uh, I'll just uh, yeah, just share my screen and I'll just briefly introduce myself. Yeah, yeah. So as you mentioned there, there, John, you know, I've worked in the VSM area now, I think, for about 20 or 30 years, right? And I know we always talk about the viable systems model and maybe how, how good it is of understanding the a business, the complexity of the business, the number of value exchanges or the number of touch points into the environment. But I want also to be able to really concentrate on the actual model of operation, because I think there is a lot of value in being able to model the operation, of course, and get control of the operation. And that's the whole idea of the management system, okay? So the management system through system four and system three should have a very, very good model of the operation. And I wanted really to try and focus in on that model, okay? How we can actually <clears throat> derive it from the data we've got within the business, or maybe if we don't have the data in the business, how do we actually capture the data? So that, that's where my main focus uh, is gonna be. So, as John mentioned, uh, I used to be a, a chief research scientist uh, for BT. Uh, going back maybe three, maybe possibly four years now, I can't, I can't believe how quickly time is moving forward. And I had two uh, main roles uh, in BT, and I've continued to take the, the, these areas forward. One of the roles was looking at, I was doing research in organizational science which sort of cybernetics is the science of, so sci sci cybernetics is the science of information and control in the anima, animal and machine, uh, as it was defined. Uh, so I was looking at organization, but I also had another important job, which was the decommissioning of BT's uh, TDM network. The TDM network is the old, old digital technology that we were using for uh, digital calls across the, across the network. And of course, that's now being replaced with IP telephony. So the challenge that I had there was to be able to decommission the network. Uh, and you can imagine that's really non-trivial. We've got six and a half thousand exchanges. We've got maybe about 20, 30 million connections going across those 6,000 exchanges. So the network is very complex. And if I'm going to decommission it, how do I know which transmission link out of the many, many millions in that network, which one do I remove first? Okay. And then which one do I move second and third? And if you look at the size of the permutative space there, it's just infinity. It's, all, it's as close to infinity as you can possibly get, okay? But that was the challenge that I had. So uh, I needed to build models of the network to be able to understand that and to stand a chance of, of being able to start building plans that would help me to, to de decommission it. And I've always done that really within the, the model of management. So I effectively had two models. I had a, a management model uh, that we, we, we know very well now through the work of Stafford. And I also had a model of the operation. And I wanna be able to take you through that. But more importantly, I want to be able to give you maybe sort of insights of how I am able to build models of operations. Okay, uh, and that is a challenge in itself. So I've, I've, so I've retired from BT, but I've continued to be able to do work. And uh, just recently, as I was also working uh, at the Khalifa University in Abu Dhabi, and I was working with some of the multinationals out there, ADNOC, the Abu Dhabi National Oil Company, Etihad. Uh, but I've done a, a major project for the telecoms incumbent, Etisalat. Uh, and I'll, I was going to have a look at this model and, and show you it in detail, so I'll just mention it uh, now. So I built an, an epidemiological model of the whole of the UAE. 
uh, and would you believe two, 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 I'm going back a few years now, two months later when I'd left the, 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 the Khalifa University to come back home, we were getting early signs of some sort of virus, you know, tracking around the world uh, with its roots in uh, Wuhan in China. So uh, little did I know I was doing some sort of very important work, unless, of course, someone within Abu Dhabi realised that this was going to go on. So that's why we're asked to do that. So, yeah, I was doing a lot of modelling work in that overall area. So I'll, I was going to cover that. But the name of the talk uh, today is really the digital unfolding of institutional capital. And I want to be able to do that through the lens of Y is equal to F of X. I mean, indeed, I could have, I think we have, I'm not even sure what the, the name of this talk is, John, but maybe it was Y is equal to F, F of X. But I want to use that as the, the lens for extracting uh, data, patterns, and ultimately information really from the system in focus. Uh, so what's the problem here? Is I think the problem we have is that, as I'm saying here, is that However much of what we knew was either highly classified or not written down. And because the business is an oral culture, right, he left very little behind, making it difficult for the business to follow on. And that happens time and time again. And certainly that was the situation in BT with the older technologies. People had worked on these technologies for almost an entire generation, maybe 30, 40 years, two generations. And they were leaving the business. And they were leaving the business with a lot of knowledge in their brains in their heads, okay? Uh, and really we didn't take that opportunity to try to, uh, to digitally unfold that knowledge and put it into a, uh, in, into a digital environment so we could automate that, the knowledge that he had uh, for maybe making changes to the operating plan for the network. So we, we lost that opportunity. So in a way, what I'm saying here is that can we find a, a, a means for being able to, uh, to capture that knowledge that an individual has uh, so it stays with the business? So as people do leave, of course, they're not, le they're not leaving with that knowledge. So, uh, so the idea is just being able to develop the, 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 a method for being able to, to capture that knowledge and being able to uh, hold it somewhere in the business. See, what I don't want to say is that we put it down into a document. So we'll put that knowledge. So John, you're leaving. You're leaving. So I want you to write down on a piece of paper, you know, what you know about system X, what you know about the allocation of ports to a line card, the line card to a line controller, and so on. And that's all uh, sort of uh, supplier specific. Uh, and if we lose that knowledge, we cannot easily put bits of equipment into the exchange. Uh, so what I want to do is to be able to develop tools and techniques that will enable me to be able to, to, to capture that. That's the essence of really what this, this, this talk is about. Uh, but what are mental models, first of all, uh, and how can we get a hold of them? So I'm just going to go through a couple of mental models I've developed over the years. When I was very young, uh, I was always interested in steam trains. And one thing that really surprised me about a steam train is that when you're putting steam into, into a cylinder, into the, in, in, into the cylinder to drive the piston, right? What happens if that piston was at the end of the cylinder, right? And it was at, on, a, on, on the exhaust stroke. Uh, how are you going to get the steam in? Uh, and I would think about this and I would build a mental model of the cylinder in relation to the axle, in relation to where it's connecting to the wheel. Uh, and I would think, well, if it's just a single piston, it's going to struggle. If we've got two pistons, how will I? But I'm, I'm building the idea here is that I'm building a mental model of, of really the, how the control system is working so that it doesn't matter what position the wheels are when the train stops, is that when you're putting steam, into uh, to, to the engine, into the cylinders. You know, there's always one cylinder that's going to be able to accept the steam and start moving and nudging forward. Uh, but that's an example. I could do that all in my head, right? Uh, I didn't need to write it down to, uh, or do anything with it. I, it was a mental model that would enable, uh, enable me to think about it and do something positive about it. The same with the motorbike. Uh, when I was uh, 14, I had a, a BSA Bantam 125. Uh, and I even remember that to this day. Uh, and we had a problem with the electrics. So I would take the electrics apart and I would try and build a picture of what was happening when I was putting it together. And I could then replay that in my mind. So these are all different types of, of, of mental models. An example there is I could take maybe on a car now, I could take the, the leads off the uh, distributor of a car and I would be able to work out how to be able to identify which lead should go into each port of that distributor. Another example, or a simple example of a mental model. 
Uh, with a car, I would need to build a mental model of the, 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 the car engine. And I would be able to use that mental model to look at the optimum dwell angle. So I was getting a good, a good spark in the engine and I was getting good combustion. So these are all sort of examples. And we do this all in our, in our lives every day. We have a mental model and we try and understand the world through these, these mental models. Uh, interestingly, uh, I was also a marine engineer a number of years ago. And we had a, a problem uh, on the ship uh, that one of the, the seacocks uh, that were connected to the hull of the ship, the flange that was on the hull side of the valve was starting to leak very, very badly, right? And remember, the flange was between the valve and the water, it was the wrong side really, effectively. So closing the valve wouldn't have stopped the water from, uh, from squeezing through the, the gland or the, or the rusting <clears throat> pipe was attached to the, to the valve and water was starting to, to come out significantly. We had bilge pumps and the bilge pumps were able to cope, okay? But I had a mental model in my mind, right? And we had a problem is that that leak was getting worse and I needed, we needed to do something about it. So I wanted to just develop the, the theme. Now I've got a mental model, but how far does that mental model take me? How far does a, does a mental model of a, of a manager in the business, how far does that take him in, in making effective decisions? So I'm going to just take it to the work of John Sturman. John Sturman works at, the, at MIT and he's developed what we're calling his bathtub dynamics. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring the two together. And, and the linkage here is trying to understand how can we actually make, bring our, our model alive? How can we parameterize our mental models, because if I can parameterize the mental model, I can put it into a digital environment and I can let that person leave the business without causing us any significant problems. So what we've got on the left hand side is you can see where we've got the seacock here on the on the, on the hull of the ship, right? And it's the side here that's starting to leak. Now, what we've had to do when we're at sea is we, we haven't actually removed the valve. If we remove the valve and we have to remove the valve, otherwise it would have removed itself when we weren't there. We're better off removing the valve when we're there, when we can do something. Uh, we needed to remove the valve. And when we remove the valve, we would affect it. We've got effectively about a, about a, a, a six inch hole effectively in, in the hull of the ship, you know, that's open to the seawater, okay? Uh, but we've got bilge pumps. But we had to make some sort of assessments. How quick was the water going to go into the into the hull, and how quickly could we take the water out with the bilge pumps? But we know we knew that the water would be going in a lot faster than what the bilge pumps could actually pump out. So effectively, for a, a, a given period of time, we would be sinking. You know, so we were going to actually cause the ship to sink. It was quite a big ship, uh, and we had to actually sort of put a new valve on. So. You know, I was the engineer that was going to do this. I was the engineer that was in the hold. Everybody else was clear. And I would have to tie myself onto the side to make sure that the water wasn't going to, you know, sort of uh, blow me away, wash me away. Uh, take under the valve and put it in. But this is an example, right? Of maybe a mental model. That mental model really could only take me forward so far. I couldn't turn the mental model into a mathematical model because these things could be quite, I didn't even know what the head of water was outside. I had no roughly the head of water, but I didn't know how to convert that into a flow into the actual ship itself. And this, was the, this is the essence of John Sturman's bathtub dynamics. So we've got quite a simple problem here I'm showing on the right hand side is we've got, this is the outflow of the water from the bath. Okay, there's the, the water flowing out. It's quite steady, quite independent of the height, whether that's paddle or not. And we can say we're changing the inflow of the water. It's a stepwise function where we have the water coming in at 75, say, litres per minute, right? And then it reduces to 25 litres per minute. But the water is flowing out at a constant rate of 50 litres per minute. So the problem that John uh, would give to his, M uh, his MBA students is to be able to just draw a graph is how the height of the water is changing through time, okay? Uh, so, so the whole idea is for them to be able to sit down and effectively it's just a three parameter model and they weren't able to get the answer by just thinking about it. You know, they couldn't just mentally look at that and understand what was going on. And yet these people are making more complex decisions in a business on a day by day basis using their mental models, okay? 
uh, in, as we know in this day and age, that's really not good enough. Uh, with we're having a digital environment, you know, we can, we, we, we can automate a lot of these activities, right? So what I want to do is to be able to, to look at this. I, I mean, you can maybe just ha have a look and maybe email me what you think maybe the answer was be. But the idea was not to be able to look at the problem, that specific problem in that sort of way. What I wanted to do is how can I extract certain types of information from what is going on in order to get a good understanding of what is happening. Uh, hence, really, the, 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 uh, the y is equal to fx through the, through the glass there, through the uh, magnifying glass. I want to be able to use that as a lens into the business, into a specific problem within the business. I'm being, I've been doing this for years uh, and seeing what we can actually just make of our equation. You know, it's just got three well, you know, it's really got two variables in the function. The function is just processing the, the X to create the Y. But it's got three sort of aspects to it, and I want to be able to just play around uh, with these ideas. And I'm going to do that uh, really through the lens of payphones. I used to be a district payphone manager many, many years ago, and I quite often use the payphone example because it's relatively simple. I don't want people to struggle with just understanding what the problem is. I want to keep the problem very, very simple. So in a way, when I was looking at the work I'm doing in America, that's quite complex with, with business cases, with uh, the financial systems and so on. So I thought, well, no, the essence is understanding. And maybe at the end of this talk is for you to see this equation in a, in, a, in a different way to the way you've seen it before. And you can start maybe looking at the world differently in terms of these variables. So that was my challenge at the end of the day. I would have thought I've been successful if you can maybe have a new way of looking, uh, looking at the world uh, through this lens of y is equal to f of x. So let me just introduce you to, uh, to pay phones. I'm just going to look at the time. Right. I think I've got plenty of time anyway, John. I've got one and a half hours. So maybe if I take an hour talking in half an hour for questions, I think that would be reasonable. Yeah. OK. Yeah, so I'm going to go back about 20 years now. Uh, 25 years. So Ian Valence at that time was chairman of BT, and he gave every district throughout BT uh, a target of 95% of all payphones working. At that time uh, in the, the Northeast District, the general manager gave me that problem. At that time, we were bottom of the league table. We were 30th in the, in the league table out of 30. Uh, same position as Newcastle, but Newcastle are starting to move up now, <laughs> move up the league table. Uh, and uh, the challenge was to be able to move us from uh, an abysmal 57% to 95% in the space of about nine months. Okay, but it was a it was a challenge that was uh, that I took on, and I was happy to move forward with. But having said that, what does that mean? So I'm looking at this through the lens now. Uh, so I want to be able to look at this through y is equal to f of x. So what we've got is I've got, I think, a familiar diagram of the first order and the second order learning loop. And I'm just going to use that to try to position uh, the, the problem in a bit of detail. So what I'm seeing here, I think I can draw on these slides. I keep forgetting I can do these things. So I'll, I'll just do that. Uh, so effectively, what have I got? So uh, remember, so the y is equal to a function of x. So x is the input. OK, but remember that x is the input is coming from the organization. So I don't understand the organization. This is the organization down here. So I've got the VSM uh, is, is a way of saying this is the organizational structure, but it's grayed out because I don't understand it. And this is the data warehouse. Of course, in that, those days, we didn't have a, a data warehouse. But I had very little, da little data when I took over this, this unit. So there were lots of Xs, lots of Xs around, lots of bit, what I mean, there's lots of bits of data, but there was no structure between the Xs. Uh, I didn't know effectively what serviceability meant, so we had a target of 95% of all payphones working. Okay, uh, so that was the that was the Y. The Y effectively, I knew the Y is equal to 95%, but other than that, I didn't know much about the business at, at, at all. There was not even a men no mental model at this stage. So there was no mental model model. There was no F to be able to improve the decision making the decision making process. So we might talk about the viable systems model. So the VSM would tell us we've got problems, okay, but it doesn't give us solutions to those problems, right? So I could have talked, put the VSM in place here, but at the end of the day, I still need that model. I still need to build a model of the, of, of the operational dynamics that somehow uh, will tell me, 
you know, whether I'm moving in the right direction or not. The challenge was to be able to meet 95%. So effectively, uh, let's have a look at that through a lens of y is equal to f of x. <clears throat> so y is equal to f of x. Uh, and <clears throat> I know what y is, but the problem is because I don't know f, I've got lots of x's, but I don't know how y and x are related. OK, that's that's a, that's a problem. But what we can use, we can use descriptive statistics. OK, we can use uh, descriptive analytics in order to be able to show these relationships. And I'll come on to that uh, in, a, in a few moments of how we can use the power of visualization to show how these things relate to each other. And it could be we have lots of X's that aren't relevant. I've got lots of, of islands of X's. So the, I could have X's over here that are not relevant, but there might be a couple of big X's that somehow influence the actual output here. So effectively, these could be the causes. So in a way, if I can identify the Xs, there are causes of Y, I can then start the, the rudimentary formations of the function that's going to do that transformation with me. So if I understand the function, what I can do is put these Xs, okay, these are the actual parameters, they're going to be in the model. I can put them through the function and I'll be able to compute really what Y is. So let's call that Y dash. So what I can do is I can compute Y dash. But uh, yeah, I'm jumping the gun a bit here. So yeah, Y is equal to X. So we can use descriptive analytics to be able to, to look at that relationship. Uh, and once I've got that, I can compute maybe what F is by using different types of uh, data mining sort of techniques. So what I can do, if I can compute F, what that tells me is now I have an explanation, right? of how X is causing Y. So effectively, uh, this moves us from descriptive to being able to explain away a certain behavior, which I'm not able to do with descriptive. All, all I know is, is just X and Y. But the F tells me how the X now is actually producing the Y. And that's very important because if I can understand the X's for payphones, okay, the things that are affecting payphone serviceability, I will be able to compute what Y is. So to me, that uh, it's moving us in, 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 the, in the right track. Now, if I've got Y is equal to F of X, <clears throat> what I can do is if I can explain away uh, Y in terms of X, right? If I've got Y, what I can do is make a, a prediction really from from the data I've got. So now I'm, if I can explain away something, what I can do is now I can actually start creating a forecast for what Y is going to be. So now if I have the, the history here, I can put the history in maybe a very, maybe complex type of nonlinear regression model. I'm not going to use time series here. Time series is where I can make a forecast, but effectively the forecast is just an extrapolation of what's happened in the past. So when, when I've got a detailed model, I can use what I'm calling a zero-based budgeting approach. I don't need to know what's happened last year, okay? I just need to know what the current state of play is at the moment. Uh, I can put that through the model, and I can then compute what's going to happen in the future. So what I can do is I can predict what's going to happen in the future, but I can do it in a very, very rich way. And here, what I've got here is also the possibility of using, well, we could be using system dynamics, but also using cellular automata. I find out that really the system dynamics doesn't always help me in being able to build budgets. I can build a high level budget with system dynamics, but I want to be able to build an operating plan that's very, very detailed. So invariably, what I'm doing is I'm reverting to using cellular automata, and I will do that inside of SQL. I'd, by the way, everything that I'm going to be doing here, that I, that I have done, done here, I'm actually building an SQL. I used to use a bit of MATLAB. Uh, I used to use, well, I, I used to use a lot of MATLAB. I used to use some of the R and other, other, other sort of programming languages, right? But now uh, I'm putting everything inside of SQL. So all the programming I'm doing is done inside of SQL, inside the database, where all the queries are being run on the data. So I've got that co-located, with, with, which is where it should be. I don't want to have separate applications and having APIs, you know, sort of connecting them together. Everything is now being done within SQL Server. So that's really powerful. So I've got, I can make a prediction now and I can do a very detailed prediction. I can build an operating plan and I can build a plan 
down to the nuts and bolts, the amount of resource I require, the timings of that resource, and I'm doing that at the moment. As I'm sitting here now, I'm actually managing 140 businesses on the Azure platform in the cloud. And I do that, I build the dynamic operating plan on an hour by hour basis. I build the plan for the day, and then I, and I, then I also manage the execution of that plan during the day. So I'm also making, by doing this, I'm making in-flight changes, right? I'm making in-flight changes to the actual operating plan itself. Uh, now let's take this a stage further. So that's why, okay? Uh, and now what we can do is if I know, so I've got why, I'm predicting why, but what happens if I'm given where I want it to go? So in a way, I, I'm going to now use what I'm calling optimization. I'm going to create a, a, a Goldilocks zone for where, for where Y should be, okay? So what I can do now is that rather than just computing X for Y, what I'm doing now is I'm actually optimization, I'm optimizing, so I'm actually computing Y, right, in relation, in relation to X. So the two are being changed together. And what I'm doing is I'm searching for the most efficient way to be able to run the business. And this is what I'm calling the Goldilocks zone. So the, the, norm, the, the normal way of diagramming it. So if, I've got, if I'm sort of looking at the resources on a, uh, for a business plan, I might have time and maybe uh, uh, sort of cost uh, and revenue with a few graphs effectively. I'll identify a zone where we should be operating within. I'll show you that maybe later on. But this is the Goldilocks zone. This is the sweet spot. This is the operating point. This is the sort of the habitable, hab habit habitable zone uh, of the actual business, right? So again, by looking at that equation, y is equal to f of x. Now, I know the function very well, right? The function is explanatory. It explains away the behavior of the business. Now that I understand the behavior very, very well, I can use that to be able to optimize that where I want to go. So this is, the, this is a revised target that's optimized based on the efficient use or effective use of the actual resources, okay? Uh, so you can see the different stages uh, that we're using uh, in order to be able to look at that model from different perspectives. You know, we can look at uh, we can look at just X. We can look at uh, looking at F. We can look at Y. So we've got all these different ways of looking at the equation and being able to come come at the problem from from different parts of our equation. Uh, so I'll just continue on. So what I want to do is to continue with the payphone problem. Because what I want to do now is I want to be able to uh, to focus in on f, uh, and then do and then somehow so once I've got the functions I somehow want to be able to bring the functions into the viable systems model in some sort of clever way. So I've got the model and I've got the I've got the the, the viable systems model and somehow and I want to sort of merge them together in in in, 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 a, in a very very clever way. So we'll see how far we get with that. Uh, but what I'm doing here is that this is actually providing the digital foundations for the work that I have been doing in, in America. So this is the foundations of the digital strategy. Uh, so, so I'm going to now bring that strategy together on, on the sort of storyboard. And I've selected two, two dimensions. It's interesting, you know, even the selection of the dimensions uh, is non-trivial. Uh, we could always just put sort of time down and cost or, or value. But I'm trying to be very, very careful. I'm talking about data, and we know that when I'm building models, right, we want the model to effectively have the same variety as what is being controlled. So the, so the, the, the variety of the regulator should be the same, if not higher, than the variety of the thing that's being controlled. Otherwise, the, 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 the controlled will be controlling the controller in a way because it won't be able to cope. So I've come up with two dimensions here. I've come up with viability on the left and variety on the right. I could put requisite variety. I could have put requisite variety, but for, uh, one, one of the reasons I decided not to, I thought I'll just leave it, leave it with variety. So having gone through the discussions before, I'm going to start putting the different parts of the way that we're looking at the problem on, on, onto a single diagram. So we know that if I'm trying to understand and solve pay phones, I need to be able to understand the business, of course. Otherwise, I've got no idea where I'm moving. So I've always got the VSM in background there that if I'm building a strategy, if I'm building a data model, I need to understand <laughs> what it is I'm trying to model. And I think I haven't come across a better model for doing it other than using the, the VSM. It tells me where the, 
the system ones are. It gives me an idea of the essential variables that I need to control. Am I going to resource the, 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 the system ones in a requisite way? So that's fantastic for doing that. OK, and then we we'll start with day zero. So we've got the model. I want to be able to actually create the digital foundations for the business. OK, so in terms of the digital strategy, I've, I've, I've got the different uh, numbering of day zero up to day end. So let's have a look at what these digital foundations would look like, because this is very, very important. Uh, and this is where I've been spending. I don't know what can I click on that? No, I just. Yeah. So what I've been doing in terms of digital foundations is, I, is I'm, I'm looking at the, the structure, the architecture of the actual warehouse itself, the data warehouse. And what we're doing is I'm bringing data in from, from a large number of disparate data sources. OK, and I'm bringing them into what I'm calling the data lake. So data lake is what I'm calling layer one of the of the data warehouse. So the data is coming into into the data lake, but effectively it's raw data. OK, but the important thing about the data lake is that the data is being moved into a digital environment, right, that I'm able to, 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 to seamlessly access the, 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 the data in, in, in the data lake in that environment. So this is raw data. <clears throat> but even bringing the data in, I've got to, I mean, it, it, it needs to stay raw because some of these operational systems, right, these are the operational systems uh, that are providing uh, transactions to, to customers, and these are real-time systems, and I want to get the data off the real-time system without putting too much of a compute burden on the actual source system itself. So effectively, I think we're, we're familiar with the terms a, 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 ATL, extract, transform, and load. Well, all I'm doing here is I'm forgetting about the transformation. I'm just ALing. I'm just extracting and loading the data into the data lake. Hence the term raw data. I'm, I'm not doing any processing on that. OK, so the raw data, by definition, is as yet not a model. We've got no primary or foreign keys that enf enforce the referential integrity between the different table structures. That is all part of the higher order. So what we do is we take the data from the data lake and we do a lot of heavy transformation. But we also change it from the native speak, the native language, because nobody really understands the language in these different databases. Some of these databases have got over a thousand tables and some tables might be called X123. It's meaningless. The labels don't mean anything at all. So it's very difficult to get your head around it unless you're, you are the developer and even the developers when I work with them, sometimes don't even understand what they've done. Uh, so what we do is we're moving into, a, a, in, into the canonical world. It's, this is the world where we want to be able to control the language we use, right? And this is where we're going to be capturing our institutional capital and putting it into these, into these individual databases as well. So what we're doing is we change the language. This is the business language that we're using here. So the tables would be larger tables, but the tables will have names like the, 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 the price of the product, the employee name, you know, the site location. The, the, this is like using the normal language, larger tables, and we're creating the relationships between these tables. So we're using what we're calling the Inman model. The in Inman is a sort of a, a data guru, and he actually focuses in on the relational model, <clears throat> where there's lots of relationships established between the tables. And we take it up a level uh, ab above that as well, hence the, the, the three levels we've got. And the, and the level above the Inman model is what we're calling the Kimball model. In Kimball, the Kimball model, uh, Kimball has done a lot of work with enterprise data warehouses, and he uses the dimensional model. Okay, so we're using a dimension models. These are models that are tailored to a given user community. So there would be a dimensional model for marketing, for sales, for employee relations, and things like that. So effectively, the, but that structure is very, very important. Uh, and what it means is that the data in this format can easily be accessed to, uh, uh, to users of Power BI. So these people don't understand heavy SQL at all. But what they can do is they can go into these databases and bring out the data. It's all about getting the right data to the right person at, at the right time. And what I've done here is I've just taken a copy of the actual structures of the data with an SQL server. Okay. <clears throat> and we've got level one, which we're calling the bronze layer. We've got uh, uh, Data Warehouse 2, which is silver, and Data Warehouse 3, which is gold. So these are the three layers that hold all the information. I'll not say too much about that in, in, in much detail, because I'm not sure if everybody uh, sort of gets involved with data, so you maybe not understand the procedures, the, 
and, and the types of structures that we can use below that. But it's the structuring, it's this, it's that, this overall framework that's very, very powerful because without the data, you know, we cannot actually uh, understand really what's going on. So I'll, I'll say, uh, that's all I wanted to say about, about, about the data side. So this is about the, the digital foundations. And now we come to the descriptive. Now, now I've got the data. Now I can gain access to the data. <clears throat> uh, what I can do is start bringing that, that data alive. So what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to go back a few years and I'm going to show you the sort of work I was doing in Abu Dhabi where I'm uh, trying to bring uh, terabytes of data alive to be able to understand the, 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 the dynamics of people moving around the UAE. Yeah. So the actual uh, work that I was doing over there, mo the modern work for Eddie Salat, culminated in, in, in having the, 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 the sort of the, 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 the prime spot at JITEX 2019. So JITEX is an international exhibition held in Dubai. Uh, and we created, I created a, a, a sort of a stand called Smart Insights. So all of the background diagramming that you're seeing here is, is, is what I developed uh, when I was working uh, in, 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 in Abu Dhabi at the Khalifa University and presenting this work on behalf of, uh, of Eti Salat. Uh, but again, it's bringing the live. So in terms of descriptive analytics, we've got this storyboard. This is an application I developed a few years ago. Uh, to be able to, to show the flow of information uh, between or, or across mul multiple dimensions. So I'm, what I'm doing is I'm using parallel coordinates and proportional flow to generate that overall graphic here. And I can tell a story and I can actually switch on different dimensions and I can do that dynamically. So the challenge was, was to be able to understand how people <clears throat> that were arriving at, at, at Dubai International Airport you know, where they were traveling, uh, where, where they would travel to throughout the, the, the UAE. But indeed, it wasn't just really the airport. Uh, the work that I was doing with Eddie Salat gave me access to the, uh, the cellular network, which I wouldn't dare show you because uh, I could show you where every cell is, every cell within the UAE. And the, uh, the, the people, when they move between cells, I know which cell they're on and what cell they're moving across. So but as they're moving between cells, I can track their movement right across the actual network. But what I'm trying to do here is I've got a lot of data. I'm just trying to bring that data alive. So as they move around, uh, we'll be able to see uh, how many people are moving around on time of day and the, and the mode of transport, whether it was a taxi, using the metro. The metro runs mainly between Dubai down to the marina and, uh, uh, and, and sort of uh, towns or whatever they're called in between. Uh, we've got the car and bus and some statistics. But remember what we're doing here is we're just bringing the data alive. There's nothing, I'm not doing anything clever with the data. The idea with these views is to gain insights into the data set and that will help me to start forming the equations. So I've gone off track a little bit with payphones, but the idea was it's not to have something that was always connected in time. I'm just showing you the, the different sort of ideas that I've picked up from different uh, projects I've been doing and how they're all coming together to help to inform my understanding. Again, this is all data. So this is a, a model that I built with just ordinary data inside a, a CSV file. And I was able to identify the, the sort of the, the various areas within, within the UAE. Uh, I've got a, a, a information to do with the, the metro layout. So I just digitized that and put the metro pathway down here. Uh, and what I've done is we've built a model called origin and destination, okay? So what we've got is we've got the Dubai airport, okay, which is the origin. We've got the destination because they were interested in the mix of people arriving in the Dubai marina, where they were coming from and maybe what the risks were. Uh, and if they were carrying a virus, I would be able to build a, a SIR model, which I'm not showing at the moment. That wasn't necessary to get the, 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 the point of view across. But the idea is I could pick two nodes and I can look at people traveling between those two nodes. And you can see here, so we've got, the, we've got Dubai International Airport uh, and we've got the marina and we can see the, the mode of travel. So I'm just using the power of visualization, uh, the power of just using data. The, the data is pretty dumb and all I'm doing is painting a picture of it. At the moment, I haven't extracted any functions from this data, uh, but it's just a case of understanding what's going on. So here we've got, yeah, we've got the travel category, we've got the gender, We've got the nationality, uh, we've got the age band, we've got the type of consumer we think we are, uh, the value segment, 
to Addis Salat, you know, uh, and the destination. So again, just through the visualization, you can maybe appreciate, you know, how much value we can just extract uh, just by looking, look, looking at in information uh, almost in its raw form, okay, and bringing that and gaining insights into that. So this is this is what's just using the, the descriptive. This is descriptive analytics is, can be very, very powerful if you've got the type, right time of graphics. So that was day one. So in America, we've built we've built the data warehouse. It's, I've just finished doing that and I handed it over about a week ago. Uh, but in parallel with that, I've been building various uh, views of their information. And what we can do is I can extract that uh, that data in real time using Power BI. And I'll just give you a quick example of, of the power. Of, of, of using Power BI now that I'm getting the data directly from the warehouse. So I'm not going to show anything sensitive here, but I'll just show you the essence of the overall framework. So we're looking in Power, Power BI now, and this is the, the data I'm bringing into Power BI. I can also create a model again in Power BI. So I bring the data in and I'm almost duplicating the model. These are the relationships between the tables that was an SQL server. I'm recreating that within Power BI because this is my sandpit. This is my area for being able just just to be able to move around uh, and in order to make sure that there is no ambiguity on how individual uh, calculations are made i've always got the queries underneath captured within power bi so there's a very very simple uh, union query where i'm bringing together information from different tables right and being able to show all of the inf this, this information in a very uh, graphical way uh, and we can look at uh, again data we can look at very quickly so i'm looking at the demand patterns uh, and what I've got within here is the viable systems model. I can move around so I can look at Colorado North. I can look at an individual town within Colorado North. And these things update on the fly. The actor, there's very little latency considering I'm accessing a very complex database because of the indexing uh, uh, that I'm using. Uh, it means we can easily retrieve the data that we want. Uh, but you can see here, there's 2019. So if 20, uh, yeah, 2020 was a washout, this was with COVID, you know, with demands very low, the capacity of the individual businesses being significantly compromised because of COVID, and we're slowly going through a, a recovery, recovery mode at the moment. But this again is just looking at the actual data. Uh, again, this is in a way, this is just simple data that I can actually just, you know, sort of click this to bring alive. So I could have vectors on here to show how the, how the performance uh, of the actual businesses are changing through time. Uh, I could have shown the Goldilocks zone. I've got the concept of the Goldilocks zone here as well, but the Goldilocks zone is normally about uh, 60 and 7.5. So this is the sweet spot. This is where we would like to be for there. Uh, and we can then develop dynamic operating plans to be able to create the, the, the vectors that's going to move these individual uh, businesses to that, to that Goldilocks zone. But this is, again, an example of bringing the actual data alive uh, from the, the, the data that we've got within the data warehouse and it's working extremely, extremely well. Uh, so we've moved away now from descriptive and we can continue our journey really up our st strategic sort of ladder here. And we talked about explanatory, okay? So with explanatory, I'm not gonna go into any more detail here because I wanna move on to, I'm doing this, this with payphones, but uh, developing an explanatory model Again, is it's supported by the underpinnings of descriptive. We're looking at descriptive, we're looking at relationships. We can start mining the relationships. We can use artificial neural networks to look at one and the other. Although the problem with artificial neural networks, it doesn't explain away. With artificial neural networks, it might say that this, this, this output is created because of, uh, as a result of these inputs. But it doesn't, it's got, there's no explanatory mechanism there because the, 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 the neural networks just don't work that way. So we've got explanatory. We're then we've got then predictive, uh, we've got prescriptive. And as I was mentioning early on, when we're looking through the lens of Y is equal to F of X, what we can do is we can actually optimize where we're looking at what that Goldilocks zone should be in relation to X. Now we've got a very good view of the dynamics F, we can bring, bring the two together. So now let's continue the theme of digitally unfolding the, the payphone network. And we can see how all this comes together in a model. So, uh, so, the mental model, by looking at the, the payphones, we can see that the mental model, by looking at the statistics and so on, that the serviceability is some function of the fault rate, the time taken to detect the fault, and the time taken to repair the fault. And that shouldn't be too surprising in a way. The higher the fault, if the fault rate increases, remember I've got no parameters here. If the fault rate is increasing, 
I know that my serviceability will reduce the number of payphone, payphones working at any given moment in time is going to start reducing. If the time taken to detect the fault, it means I've got a faulty payphone, but if I don't know it's faulty, right, uh, I'm going to have, uh, again, the, the numbers are just going to start adding up. So the number of faulty payphones is going to increase because I, I don't even know that they've gone faulty. So we had to develop some clever techniques to get around that problem. But I just wanted to really to look at the actual equations and how I can bring them together in a, in a special way. And then we've got time taken to repair the fault. So if I know we've got a faulty payphone and I obviously don't repair it, it's still faulty and it's going to then start again reducing serviceability. So that was the shape of the, of, 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 of the actual equation. Remember before we didn't know what the X's were. Okay, we didn't know what the X's were. Now we've got an idea of what the X's are, right? I know what the serviceability target is, okay? But I want to be able to compute what serviceability I'm going to get for a given fault rate of say 20 faults per year, time taken to detect and so on, okay? Uh, but that was effectively the mental model. So I can look at a situation and effectively these are what, what you might call maybe uh, navigational models. They'll give you a general idea where to, what direction to move in without having it right down to a degree. These are general directions, but I, I've got to be able to improve upon this and parameterize it and then put it inside the database against the data it's going to sit along to. Along to. So my challenge now is to parameterize the actual model itself. Uh, so I'm going to start with the model we know very, very well. And what I've done down here is uh, I've got three system ones, but they're not really proper system ones because one of the system ones is going to be focused in on the fault rate. The other one to do with the detection of, of the faulty payphone. And the third one is to do with the repair of the actual payphone. So we're doing some work with the, the maths. We can uh, come, a, come up with that. The serviceability uh, of, the, of the payphone area is one minus the fault rate, right? Uh, so we've got the fault rate as parameter X1. So I'm starting to parameterize the model now, divided by 8760. Right, multiplied by the time taken to detect and repair the fault. And these are the individual X's that are being passed in. So we've got the model here. There's the model. There's, there's the model F. Uh, there's the output Y and there's the input X. So the input X is as a vector. But what I want to do is to see how I can organize that with the viable systems model because I want to be able, I want the VSM to help me to manage the model as well because we're, <clears> we can find ways of improving uh, the model that I don't particularly want to go into at this time. So what we've got is we've got the resource bargain that's being established between system three and the various system ones. <clears throat> uh, so what we've got there is that, yes, yeah, so for the first system one, we're going to pass it at 20.5 is the fault rate. So it's got a target of 20.5 uh, faults per payphone per year. Oh and what it's going to do, it's going to unfold this. <clears throat> this equation is now going to unfold and we're going to actually amplify the variety. So what we can do is we can identify what factors, again, it's going through the same process, right? So we've got to actually develop a model now. So before I had a model for serviceability, here I've now want a model for fault rate. So what we do is we're going to break that process down and create a model for fault rate, okay? But it's interesting that these models are inside the existing models. OK, uh, and I'll show you what I mean by that. I, 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 was, I wasn't going to show this, but I, I thought I'll, uh, I'll show it. <laughs> so what I've got here is, the, is, is a fractal. The fractal is created by a very, very simple equation. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to drill into part of this. This is a MATLAB model I built uh, a few years ago. I'm going to dr drill into the fractal here. So I've got a box around here. Oh, I don't know what happened there. I press the wrong key. Yeah, so I'm drilling into here, right? So I'm drilling in. So first of all, I'm just showing you exactly what's inside that area. And this is the, the clever thing about the way that the, these fractals work is I'm going, to em, I'm going to increase the resolution, right, of that image, right? So what I'm doing is I'm just going to go that, down to the next iteration. Now, that's exactly what I'm doing with the fault rate. Here, we've got the fault rate. Uh, so this represents the fault rate. So the next picture will be then telling me what's going to be happening inside that fault rate. So you can see now I'm drilling inside, I've got more detail, but that detail is contained into that higher level, lower details model. And this is important because I don't want to pass all of that variety up the line. 
otherwise management would become overwhelmed by it. So this is like a container for this variety that I don't want to expose. I will only expose the algodonics that it's struggling with. But what I'm doing is that mathematically, I'm containing that equation inside of that equation. And I can continue. I'm going to zoom in into this little area here, which you couldn't even see here. If I looked at that area on this initial diagram, it might just be an individual pixel, but I'm going to drill down, okay, and add more detail. So this is what I'm calling about intra-recursivity. I'm actually uh, adding extra granularity by going into that individual object, okay, and that keeps everything very, 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 very well aligned. So what I'm doing with these equations, once I get there, yeah. Yeah. yeah, what I'm doing with these equations, right, I'm doing that intra-inspection. I'm going inside of that equation <clears throat> with a more detailed equation. <clears throat> I can, and that keeps everything, that keeps the overall structure congruent. And this is where the context changes. This is concerned with, with, with uh, serviceability. This is concerned with serviceability, but the main aspect of this function is to, is to deal with fault rate. And it's got two embedded system ones because it's looking after different aspects of that fault rate. And what I can do is, and then we can continue down. But one of the issues I wanted to bring out here is that when we're dealing with payphones, mental models are used all the time in trying to make an assessment of the type of payphone enclosure, the location of the payphone, and the relocation of payphones as well. Because if we can re relocate the payphone in an area that's less vandalized, it means that it's going to continue to work. It's going to become more serviceable. But this is the sort of the knowledge that's inside the heads of our senior managers when they go out there to make these assessments. So what we were doing at the time is we were capturing just by using logic gates about if this situation arises, what would you do? We would do that. So effectively, this logic gate is the, is the mental model that we've implemented digitally within a digital environment. And we can actually run these so we can pass it pass data to these and we'll get a, an answer out in terms of what we'll do with this enclosure, uh, what, we, what we should do with the selection of a location and what you would do with relocating the payphone. So I'll continue on. So what I'm doing now is to do with time taken to detect the fault. That is a very, very complex set of processes down here that people uh, uh, have developed based on their experience. I'm able to bring that into play and we have a set of equations broken down further down to a, just one lower level of recursion and being able to repair, increase the, the speed of repair. And that is very much dependent on, on the schedules that we create up here as well. But the idea is we can combine all of these models into a single, into a single equation. And the interesting thing about this <clears throat> is that that equation <clears throat> is the organization. <clears throat> that equation is actually how we organize our people. Uh, so we started with a challenge of nine months ago, going back 20 odd years ago, to be able to move us from the bottom of the league table, you know, and be able to have a serviceability of around about 95%. And it was good to find out at the end of that period, you know, that we got the top serviceability uh, sort of award throughout the UK, that our serviceability, uh, the target was 95% and we exceeded that. And we had a, a, an overall uh, sort of service, uh, serviceability level of 98.7%. So uh, again, that is using sort of data uh, and using models. I'm trying to understand really what an organization is really. An organization to me is a computer. It computes, it's doing computations all the time. Uh, and this was before the days of having sort of powerful computers uh, and individuals would just be doing this on a spreadsheet on a simple, uh, maybe it's on a simple PC, not using a lot of data, but effectively it just demonstrates that, you know, that uh, being able to gain a new insight in terms of what the model is, what the actual, uh, the, the, the management model is, and, and the way that the, they're very, very close to each other. So the whole purpose of this model of, of, of the VSM is to manage these models. That's what it really comes down to. That's what it meant for me, right? Uh, and obviously I was able to, to do very, very well uh, with that sort of insight. <clears throat> So I don't think there's anything else after that, John. I'll see what's on the next slide. I, I pulled these slides together last minute, but yeah, that was it. That was, that was the last slide. So I don't think there was anything else I wanted to, to say other than just to, just to finish with that. Thank you. Okay, that was, that was brilliant, Steve. Thanks for really very, very much. Can you stop sharing the screen now? We can get everybody up again. And Okay, I will do. I can, yes. I can throw it open for questions. So who'd like to start?
Okay, I'd like to start. Yeah. <laughs> um, this the when you the VSM came up at the end. You had three system ones, which were, if I remember rightly, one is the um, the fault rate. One is the time to get the fault detected. One is the time to get the fault fixed. Exactly. Yes. Okay. But um, for me, those would not be systems one. So, so somewhere that you're doing a, a system one to me would be, you know, the, um, the the people actually doing the repairs or the people doing the detection or so to, to actually, I mean, is, is that how you saw it? Because you, you've got the way you described it, which you said, okay, the, the time to detection is a system is a system one. Yeah. But, but was there an organization behind that? Oh, no, of course, John, there's people behind that people make this happen oh yeah i mean i think in each of those system ones right there would be maybe about 40 or 50 people working in each one yeah okay yeah. That, that would... yeah and we talk about a system one right so how might we identify a system one remember my objective at a very very high level was 95 percent. it wasn't a case of maybe whether that unit was viable because there could be a lot of cross subsidy being passed across to it anyway right but to me when I talk, use the VSM, right? It's about managing a managing a target requirement. So it could be that the VSM is to do with managing the project. <clears throat> you want the project to be successful. Yeah. You know, break okay. it down into various tasks. So these are all managed entities. We are managing something at each level. So each one of these system ones are being managed. We've got to manage the fault rate. We've got to manage the time it takes us to detect the fault. Otherwise, if we don't, right? The overall objective of the entire unit, of course, which is meeting that serviceability target, would be compromised. Okay, so it works perfectly within that within that environment. If I'm talking about a real business unit of viable of viability, I would be having the essential variables that we're managing <clears throat> within each system one. Each system one would have a, a range of a, a range of different metrics that it would be doing, but each system one would have to be viable. So each system one would have a PL. So what, the work that I'm doing in America. We've got 140 companies and each one's got a p and L. I know the profit, the operating profit, all of that, the amount of loans we've got to get us through COVID, all of that is very well documented. But it's just, a, to me, it's a, exactly the same problem, whether it's, it's real viability. Because I know Stafford would define viability as the ability of being able to sell a business off into, back, into the, back into the market. That was his definition of viability. So things like uh, maybe the HR department wouldn't be viable because it hasn't got external customers. If you put that outside, of course, it's going to die. It's not going to get any revenue on day one. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But that's okay. I don't have an issue with that. Okay. Great. And 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 the the other question was, um, you you develop these um the, these equations which you say just describe those various system ones, and you've got an equation for each of the systems one. Yeah. Um, and what what I'd be interested. In, I mean, it, it's the the the, the results are. Very, very impressive that you went from being the worst in the country to being the best in the country, or one of the yeah. best anyway. Yeah. And, and, and clearly, I'd, I'd just like to, if you could talk a little bit about the links between the, deriving those equations and, and getting an understanding of what that system one actually was in terms of the computation and, and how that actually translated into improvements in each of these three system one's performance, which led to this overall result of the 97.8%. Yeah, well, if we take fault rate, John, so the way that I'll go through this, right, so it's, it's obvious, right, if a payphone is working, right, it's providing a service, so it's serviceable. If it's not providing a service, it's not serviceable, okay? So that, that's very, very black and white. You can either use the payphone or you can't. I mean, it's never that simple because it might be that the kiosk is damaged and the payphone is working fine. But, you know, there's always that issue. But let's just look at the fault rate of the actual payphone itself. Uh, in the spirit of maybe your question, if I understand it correctly. So we've got a, a payphone with a certain fault rate. Now I've got to ask myself, or that unit, I'm trying to amplify the variety as we're going further down. Mm -hmm. So that, that unit has been tasked with reducing the fault rate of the actual payphone itself. So it could be we, we can reduce the fault rate by making the actual equipment inside the payphone more reliable, right? So then it comes down to making sure we're, we've got good records. When we're repairing it, do we know what it is we're repaired. We're not just re replacing one pair form with another, we're going inside it and replacing some of the, the broken bits. We can actually document what the, the root cause of that failure was. 
It could be that the payphone, and this was a significant problem, as you could expect, uh, was vandalized. Vandalism was a big, big, big problem. Okay, mm. So if you've got the same payphone being vandalized all the time, it's pointless keeping it in that same location. Can we not relocate that payphone? Could we not put it in maybe a better, a better enclosure? Uh, also, with we're being on the northeast coast, uh, there's a lot of dampness that get inside the payphone. So if, it, if the enclosure was open, the, the, the water ingress would affect the mechanism. Uh, things would start to rust if we weren't using really high quality materials in the construction of the payphone. So that would be another area we would need to look at as well. Okay, And relocation is a, is a big challenge. It's using the skills to identify a suitable place to be able to put them to. How do we come up with our assessment? And that was the mental models that the engineers would build up over years and years of doing this. And it's a case of capturing that in a set of sequence of logic statements that I can put in an SQL and automate. You know, but that was it. That, that's how we would go about really adding the extra levels of granularity to get an understanding, an ex a better understanding uh, of, of what the fault rate was and what that model is that, we, that we, where we can improve it. So now <clears throat> I had a simple <clears throat> model for fault rate, which is looking at the fault rate of the machine. I was able to incre increase its granularity by looking at the equipment, the supplier, by looking at relocations and so on. So I was refining it, then I can refine it. So, so through time, I had a, a better model for dealing with fault rate. Okay, which involves things like identifying faulty components that were coming from a particular supplier <clears throat> and swapping to another one and so on and so forth. Exactly, exactly. And we would have one or two suppliers and we might find out that a certain type of payphone would work better, certainly down the coastal areas where there was a lot of dampness because their construction methods would be different. So you wouldn't, you wouldn't get two exactly the same. So by definition, we'd expect one to be a wee bit better than the other. So again, it's having good, a, a good uh, data uh, available for you to be able to use analytics to try to tease out these th these different behaviors yeah. okay thank you yes yeah. alfredo and hello alfredo long time no see i still can't see him <laughs> he's down the bottom i'll unmute him <laughs> you need to unmute alfredo Sorry, yeah, can you hear me now? Yeah, we got you. Oh, yeah, I, can, I, can, I can see you now. I can see you now, Alfredo. I, I enjoyed your talk as usual, Steve. Um, okay, so you, you you showed a certificate which you got um, the problem seemed to be uh, solved almost. Uh -huh. so we, we can't argue with your mental model. You've got a mental model. It, it seems to me quite reasonable, the three factors you mentioned, and um, it seems to have um, produced results. The only thing I would disagree with you was the, the very, very, very last line in all your slides, the last sentence you wrote. And you seem to imply that last sentence that the organization could be, no, we'll say replaced, but the organization could be synonymous with your model. And no, exactly. That's, no, that's why I would disagree. I mean, the organization, is, as, as Bible system shows, is much more than that. I mean, I'm not arguing against your model. Um, as I say, it seems to have worked, mm -hmm. but, but that is only part of the problem. It's not, it's, you can't then, I didn't like the jump to the organization. Oh, no, I, I don't, I, I, I certainly don't have an issue with what you're saying, uh, Alfredo, but what I would be, what I would still say is that it's the kernel of the model. I know it's, of, of course, when I say that, I, you know, uh, I'm a bit tight lipped. I know it's not the organization, but it, it forms the basis of the actual organizational kernel, right? That's the decision making engine, right? It's going to you know, provide real value into the environment. I think that acts as the kernel and other things like it, everything, you know, everything around. Remember, remember, the VSM is a functional model, right? It doesn't tell you who's reporting to who. It's really a model of functionality. It's telling us the functions. The people working around it have got to make sure that the, each of these functions are doing what we're expecting it to do. So when we build a resource bargain, we're providing resources for these functions, right, to, to be operated and to be delivered against a, an, a, an SLA, SLA agreement. So remember, the VSM doesn't include people. It's only a functional model of the actual operation itself. Yeah, but all your... But I can see that you can you can spot from your data you can you can get a good detection rate when yeah. something's gone wrong. You can also uh, check your figures how long does it take to respond to the 
to the fault, all, all these things, fine. Mm -hmm. But also, you've got to have uh, a management system that, that can supply the, the technicians, the, the repair people, um, the cost of uh, the transport, the repair people to the to the phone booth. I mean, all these things are extra to your model. Your model is is a a reasonable. It's a model. <laughs> I know it's, it's not it's, it's, of reality. But it's not, I, know, it's yeah. like when you, I mean, there's a lot more to it than to the problem. Um, I mean, the northeast. Have you got enough? Technicians, have you got etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Have you got enough money to pay them? Have you so all, all these uh, um, extra things? Have you, I mean, your model is a good start, I would think. But yeah, not. but I, I would say if I go back to what I said before, there, Alfredo, I think it can form the kernel of the organisation. You know, it's it's really the the the, the the base layer that you would put down, you can build upon that. So now we've got a function, which is a resourcing function. You've got to make sure you've got sufficient resources. Otherwise, the function might say you want 10 engineers. Uh, but we haven't got 10 engineers. Where are we going to get the other, other two engineers from? And I know that would be outside of that, but that could just be another model. But I don't have an issue with what you're saying. I think, I think there's a few people have made that similar reply. Uh, but I, 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 I'm OK with that. But I'm saying it's the kernel. We can build from that. This is the key model. This is what the business is about. This is what it's doing. And then we can then just support that by adding around it, adding around it. Yeah, okay. I think so. I think so. Okay. I think so. Yeah. Okay, another question. Elena. Uh, did you use indices on those three, um, three uh, work items uh, to detect if there were changes in time, um, how they operated? Oh, no, Elena, yeah, yeah. We would have what we call maybe the control limits around each one, right? So when we're establishing a resource bargain, Elena, with the system one, right? Uh, nobody can work to a perfect figure. I couldn't say, you know, the fault rate would need to be 20 faults uh, sort of per year. And that would change through time, of course, remember, when we took over, we would have a high fault rate. We want to have a lower fault rate. So what we would do is we would calendarize the fault rate so it would be uh, reducing through time. We do want to have a high. But around that fault rate, there would be a set of control limits that we would think would be reasonable. So as long as we're inside of those control limits, OK, uh, that would be quite acceptable. OK, mm -hmm. so it might be 20, maybe, uh, say, 20 you know, uh, minus 1 plus 2. You know, making so we can have significant improvements. But yes, of course, using a, effectively like a control chart uh, around that, and it would be time dependent as well because we want to make an improvement. It's not a case of it being a horizontal line. Uh, the fault rate should be reducing and serviceability should be increasing significantly. But that's yeah, we're, we're doing that, of course. Yes. Yeah. 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 I think I, I would imagine also that there might be, you know, some transients. Like if you've got a bad snowstorm or a flood. <clears throat> no, I mean actually, yeah, yeah. So. The big problem invariably is the is is the winter time down by the coastal areas, right? So uh, so we would have seasonal adjustments because mm. we'll have. But the thing is, we would have the history anyway, so we know how where you are geographically. Being maybe within a half a mile of the coast, Elena, you would be susceptible to this. I would know the number of payphones down there. I would understand what's happening historically. So yeah, we we do have a, a seasonal adjustment to these trends. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Martha, did you have a question? Yes, I have. Hi, Steve. Thanks. Hi, Arthur. Um, on a bit, uh, on a bit uh, higher uh, um, level, um, you know, um, uh, suppose you would, we would not know about your model, but you would propose your plan of attack for this. Mm -hmm. And then you would get the opposition from people like say, uh, well, this is a, a complex social technical system mm -hmm. and uh, you don't have requisite variety and, and, and so you can't, your, your engineering approach to a complex system won't, won't uh, work. And um, what would be your argument <clears throat> to say that it will work in a complex environment? Yeah. Uh I think, first of all, Arthur, remember, uh, because of the experience I've had in the past, I'm always, I'm always working very closely with these people, right? Do you and, like the scrambled eggs? And, 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 the, 
<laughs> I'll have scrambled eggs, yes, please. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Also, I'm working very, because I've got to get these people on board, okay? And ultimately, I'm, I'm not able to make any progress just by working on my own. Right? So I'm working, I'm working close, closely with them. And we're always building in America. We'll run a couple of pilots. We'll have pilot areas, pilot, pilot business units, where we're testing these ideas as well, just to make sure that they're going to work. So they're under, under, under close scrutiny. But I've always got the, I thought a case of getting the buy-in. I'm working with these people. You know, I'm using their knowledge. I'm saying I, I don't know anything about this business. I might know a lot more than what them do, but I, I don't ever approach the problem in that way. I want to work with these people. I want to, not necessarily to win them over. I want to, we are working together. It's not as if I've, I've got all the answers and I'm telling them what to be able to do. So I think because of my approach, I don't have maybe the type of issues maybe you were referring to as if I'm working in isolation and all of a sudden now I'm coming with a new idea and I want to be able to force fit it into the organization. I am oh. working with the organization. So any issues like that that would be coming up, I think would be dealt with very, very early on because we're always wanting to move forward. So I've, I've always done that. Even within BT, it's always, that's the important thing. I think that's why maybe what I'm doing does become successful is because I'm working with the people who are going to be using it. Uh, yeah. Okay, but it could be a discussion with... Uh, 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 complexity scientists, uh -huh. uh, people that have some more knowledge of the theory mm -hmm. and um, they they got the, the idea that you can't model a complex social technical system and what mm -hmm. your engineering approach doesn't work mm -hmm. uh, because of, and then a, an, an array of, of scientific uh issues like a uh, did what where is how do you include the observer in your work and you know all those things that you would run into if you would have this discussion with scientists do yeah. you have a uh do you what what would be your scientific argument that this works yeah well uh let's let's look at maybe where, where people come into the equation uh Arthur, right so you can imagine if i was going to highly automate if I could highly automate what I'm doing, and I have to a certain degree done that, but anyway, well, if I can highly automate what I'm doing, I would argue that I've got a complicated system. I don't have a complex system. I only have a complex system is that when I'm bringing people into that system, people are, are complex, right? So that makes it complex, okay? Uh, so what is my challenge there is that, so I'm providing, say, an instruction. I'm, building a res I'm autom automating the resource bargain. I create a resource bargain. And I want the, uh, the manager of that business unit to buy into that resource bargain. I also want to ensure that he's going to interpret that resource bargain in the way that I've interpreted because there could be an issue there. So it means that if his interpretations are slightly different, okay, that's where the, that's where the, the complex system sort of starts coming into, into play. It's not behaving in the way that I'm expecting it to, to behave because you can't invariably tell people what to do. You know, you can try and coerce them, but ultimately it's their interpretation, their views on the day. But ha having said that, right, so part of my overall, I've got a, I, I didn't have a chance to talk about cybernetics, would you believe? But I've got a cybernetic loop in here. So I've got, a, I've got what we call a feed forward and a feedback loop, right? So the feed forward loop means I've got a very good F function. I know what F is. OK, I know the Goldilocks zone, but I'm working with Goldilocks zones now. Uh, I'm working out what X's are. So I, I give the, I put the X's into the operating plan and in the, in the, in the X's should be uh, sort of computed uh, in the way that we would expect them to be computed because we work with these people. So they know what to be able to do. OK, uh, but if they're doing something different, I will find out, you know, within an hour. Remember, I've got an hourly cadence. Every hour I know what's going on. Uh, in the business, okay? So that feedback, I would know that something is wrong there. I'm making a prediction. I'm, I'm making a feed forward prediction. Even though I've got feedback, I'm heavily reliant that the feed forward's always feed forward. I'm not using any error correction, okay? Uh, because if my current state of that system is changing, so the state of, the, of that system is changing, I'm still using feed forward. Uh, I'm just r r processing the new input. It's not like having an error, where I've got an error term and I'm integrating the error term to get rid of the offset. I'm not using, it's there, but I don't really use that. Uh, but if I see any, so anything anomalous, I should be able to pick up through the information system. So I'm, I'm saying that's where I'm looking to happen. I'm looking at service levels. I'm looking at revenue. I'm looking at product 
ratios. I'm looking at all of that. If, if that's coming back, that's fine. If it's not coming back in the way that I'm expecting it to be, uh, I would need to be able to effectively almost pick up the phone and, and try to understand what's going on. But that's how I'm dealing with really the complex system is really through the feedback. It's the feedback uh, telling me that what I thought was going to be happening is no longer happening. So there is a, an issue somewhere, but it's, it's a way of you know, trying to resolve that dilemma. Yeah. Okay. Would that be like an explanation that if you're visualizing and monitoring the macro variables, mm -hmm. you are not so much concerned with all the, the small local variations and, and say the, the high variety of every situation is, 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 is maybe collapsed in this macro variable that you are monitoring. Ah, right. No, I'm, I'm at the moment, I'm monitoring all. <laughs> yeah, I'm monitoring all the way down to the individual transaction. Up, yeah, because I can do that. I can do that so easily. I can switch between levels, Arthur. So yeah. I, I think in that very brief view I gave you using Power BI, I can look at the level of the franchises. I can look at the, the level of the corporate group. Right. And I can just through a flick, a flick of a, a switch on the, on the screen I can go down to a district. I can then go into the district, I can go down to a business unit, and I can go down to an individual. I can look at the productivity of an individual employee. So I'm moving up and down all the time down yeah. to that level of detail because I can. I mean, really, the technology of this day and age allows us to be able to do that. So yeah. I, can, I, can, I can move right across that space. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, Brian, you had a question. Thanks. Need to unmute, Brian. Can you hear me? Yeah, we're here. In. Okay. I can hear you, Brian. Thanks a lot. Uh, so I specialize in excellence in regard to the VSM in disclosing how ignorant I am of it. <laughs> I'm extremely excellent in that, right? So you're ready. <laughs> right. Right. You've got me in the corner now, Brian. Go on. I'm in the corner now. <laughs> no, I'm extremely excellent. So oh, one God. of the, what I did have the thought before you mentioned it, in defense of myself, I'm not totally ignorant that where did a neural network come in? Because I knew something about training neural networks, right? Yep. But this okay. is the question. There's a distinction, is there not in the VSM between say what happens in S4 where you simulate the economy or whatever it is that Stafford Beer did in Chile, supposedly, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And the people in the economy and likewise in the firm, you mm -hmm. may have a simulator in S form, in S4 of the situation you're in, right? And right. that's a program, that's on a computer, but there are the people too. So this is getting back to the question asked earlier as where, what is the difference between what you're doing, which is computational, and you almost have a kind of a God's eye view. You, as, as you were saying, you can switch between levels. Yes. But in my understanding of the VSM, those levels are where there are actually people walking into um, an operations room, right? Mm -hmm. And making decisions. They're sitting in chairs. I've got a diagram of it on the back of a paper I wrote, right? <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. So they sit in chairs and they talk. It was like a club, right? Mm -hmm. So there are people, you know, usually involved in the VSM and there are computers as well. And it seems to me, I'm struggling to, to to see how both of those things fit together in what you've done. Yeah. So I think the uh, when we're talking about people at the moment, Ryan, I, I view them as being, uh, in a way, that being managed through the, the models in the VSM. They are responsible for, for a given model, OK? And if that model is not requisite, it's not working as it should do, we've got to get brains together. We've got to get real brains outside of the silicon environment to come together because they are maybe focusing on that. Remember, their costs are already attributed to that function. They're being paid, right, to be able to provide a, a functional service to parts either outside the business or parts inside the business, okay? So if that function is not performing as it should do, okay, uh, and remember, these people are being paid through by that function. The resource bargain is paying for the labor of the people, but these people would come together in time and space, the managers of that, because that has to be managed. That, that system one has got a management layer, okay? And what we're doing is we're having to resource that management layer, okay? Uh, 
And if we and uh, yeah, so effectively, that, there we are. We, we've got a set of metrics coming from the VSM. We're managing that model. We're managing uh, the performance of that model in, in terms of the control the, the, within the control limits of the controller. You go outside of that controller, the management would have to ensure that we're staying within these control limits. They come together, they have a discussion to understand what is going on. They generate new knowledge. Okay, the whole idea of brains coming together using a shared white space to be able to share their their viewpoint and increase the size of that shared white space. So if that shared white space represents the knowledge or the variety within the actual process, and that's no longer requisite, it's not fit for purpose. They've got to generate a new set of work and practices. So it means they've got to increase the knowledge that they've got. They'll do that by conversation, the power of the conversation or bringing a consultant into play. So they've now got new knowledge that they'll implement that will maybe resolve that situation. So I'll say it. Thanks. Okay. Other questions? I have a question. Okay. Lynn. Um, hi. First of all, I, I want to say this is so interesting and powerful that um, I'm, I'm um, the board chair is my turn for a, a rather large uh, homeless shelter you know, housing uh, program. And uh, we use, we have to produce a lot of data, continually have to produce a lot of data. And we've only begun to use the data with our employees. And the way you've mapped it, everybody's talking about, well, what about the people and the data and the people and the data? and and. And I think of two examples. One, when I was involved with the Obama campaign, the first time he ran for office, the entire campaign in the offices were run on data. Today, how many people did we call? How many <laughs> things did we see? How many doors did we knock on? Uh -huh. And it was so inspiring. And, and what every single office did was they put the data on the wall on butcher paper. Mm -hmm and then compared it every evening within all the districts. And what happened was when you said the brains got put together, when they saw, okay, this is what we could do, this is what they did, then because of the data, they went, oh, we can improve it this way. Mm -hmm. We did the same thing with the operations staff, with the, um, I'm just, with, with, the, um, with the housing, um, thing that I'm dealing with, you know, operate uh, nonprofit that I'm chairing. And that's that they just were falling behind and taking care of the buildings. And so we weren't turning over the, the people fast enough. And we gave them the data and said, hey, you know, this is what's going on. And then we said, instead of giving you guys a raise, we're going to give you at the end of the month, you know, a, a, a bonus. <clears throat> And they saw the data and suddenly, I mean, you should see our turnover rate. Mm -hmm. It's just like, so what I'm, when you said organizations is computational, mm -hmm. um, that's, I, I could see very much how that worked together because it's about production and it's about achieving a, you know, these higher, the higher levels. And you can't do that without knowing where you stand. No, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And, and, yeah. and knowing where you stand inspire, you don't have to manage the people anymore. They'll manage themselves mm -hmm. they because they can see where they're going. If no, you don't know where you're going, you can't, you don't know. And I think the computation glues it all together because it's a computation. You can see how everything relates to each other. Otherwise the computer is not computing. It's just, it's just going to, it's, yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Right. Right. You just don't know where you are. No idea. It, yeah. Yeah. And that means that it has to be top down control mm -hmm. to make all the, the, the cats stay in line, you know, I yeah. mean, it's, yeah. So, yeah, but yeah. certainly got to be, I, I'm not sure about control there, but it's, it's got to be congruent. That's the important thing. If it's congruent, yeah. Yeah. people understand where they stand and it's congruent because of that infolding. I was showing when I showed you the fractal, I'm going inside a pixel and blowing it up, but we know that what I've blown up is inside a pixel and we know, so we can see how everything connects to everything. To me, that is so, so, so powerful. Yeah. It is so yeah. powerful. It enables me okay. to build all of, 
it enables me to build all of these complex models, but they're all con they're implicitly congruent because of that, that, that structuring that I'm using there. For these people to understand that this little fixing this little room will affect the entire organization and the yep. way it goes yep. will, is powerful. That's, that's what you're kind of saying too, I think. Yeah, no, that's exactly what I'm saying. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That but, it has but, profound effects on the data as a whole. Yeah. You know, it really yeah. does yeah. too. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, if, if I could just make a comment, I mean, the, the, this is exactly what, what I've done applying viable systems in cooperatives is providing the data that people need to organize their own work. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And rather than have data going up into remote boardrooms where people are making all these crazy decisions, if you feed the data back to the, the people actually on, on the, the coalface doing the work, you can, without any targets, or any coercion of any kind whatsoever, things change enormously. Just because, providing John, because the right sort of data. Yeah, because they know what they've got to do, John, isn't it? If you're in that congruent framework, yeah, they know yeah. exactly what's expected of them. They can get on and just do it. Yeah, of course, indeed. They don't have to wait to be told, but they know how they fit into that bigger picture. Yeah, very, yeah. very much. I was just wondering, is Brian still on the call, John? I've yes, got it, maybe. Are you still on I'm the call, here. Brian? Yes. I'm still here. All right, I was just going to show it. Can I just share this last slide, John? Yeah, of course. Uh, uh, let me. You, where, you have control. Right. <laughs> where's the? Sh oh, yeah. I've got the screen share here. I think going back to what you're saying before, Brian, I've got a, a, like a simulation uh, model running in PowerPoint. I'm just going to show you this. Uh, in fact, come up here. Yeah. Right. This was the one about the neural networks talking to each other, creating a shared white space. And what we can do is we can actually. The size of the shared white space, the interaction between these brains is really is a, is a measure of intelligence. So what I'm trying to show on this diagram here, effectively, is the business running. So I'm using cellular automata here. OK, so this is the business. Uh, it, it, and the reason I'm using cellular automata is that mathematics is the science of patterns and not everything is patternable. OK, uh, I can create I can create a, a simulation using cellular automata, right, where each each uh, where the, the next sort of output of it is a, effectively almost like a random number, right? It appears random from outside because you don't know, you know, how to compute the next number. If you could actually, if the, if the numbers were computable using maths, it wouldn't be a random number. But you wouldn't recognize the pattern. You couldn't discern the pattern by just looking at the numbers themselves because the underlying process is so, not necessarily complicated, but it isn't, it isn't patternable. There are no patterns that it's generating where we can get a hold of it using mathematics. So this is using cellular automata at the bottom, right? What I'm doing is putting it through a process. This is the data modeling. And this is looking, this is the algodonic, right? And this is the algodonic, right? That's running here to say that uh, the function isn't performing as it should be performing. So effectively what we've got is we've got brains coming together. And I'm using team integrity here. My team's integrity is bringing large teams of brains here, and I'm using a neural network in the brain where these are talking to each other and trying to be able to understand what the issues are in the operation. Okay, and then what they can do as a result of that is then through that new knowledge, through the increase in the shared white space, so the increase in the shared white space is DK, delta K, is the change in the knowledge, i.e. it's new knowledge. And we bring that back into the operation down here. So this is what I was trying to show that is the algodonic is, is absorbed by intelligence, by real brains, right? It doesn't, doesn't happen to be because we can use, you know, higher level machine learning algorithms. Uh, yeah, so I was just wanted to try and show that, that exactly. So if something's going awry, we'll get brains together. Uh, but these brains are all resource through the resource bargain because that, that function's got a, its own management layer that has to be paid for through the resource bargain uh, and sustained through the, the continuous generation of value that they're delivering either into the business or into the, in, into the environment. So would yeah, that was all I all ask all, a yeah, yeah. Can I ask a question, Stephen? Yeah, sure, sure. Uh, would it be, I'm, I'm trying to grasp what you've done. Is it the case that what you've done is take the VSM itself as a guide yes. to how to handle this F? in the no, y it, equals f of x no exactly yes i am yes exactly yeah so Absolutely. it's not as though you can walk into a building and say right this is level three and they're sitting in the club talking about how they should solve this or that problem mm -hmm. right with the the people 
and they might have a computer to simulate the environment, you know, a la mm -hmm. S4 with mm -hmm. a Forrester dynamic system. What well, what what was Forrester's um, dynamo system or something like mm -hmm. that, right? It's not, that's not what's happening. You've taken the whole VSM at multi levels in order yeah. to get an idea as to how to derive this f in the y equals f of x. Is that the case? Well, remember that that f would be if that f really is the model is the, is 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 the model of that function. So it, it's relevant to the function that we're trying to model, Brian. So we'll take a given function to do with payphones, right? We've got a function to do with fault rate, okay? Uh, so from the higher, high, the highest level, we know that that has to try and remember it's a function, but if you've, you've got the real dynamics, you've got people behind it, you've got real things behind it. Remember that function is just a function, a mathematical function, but it's furnished with data from the real world. There's data coming in from the real world, which is the X, because uh, uh, X is the resources. The X are the resources to be able to run that function. So within X, you've got to pay for the, the management. You're paying for system five, four, three, two, one. All of these are being paid for uh, within that function. So that's all there. It's all monitored, okay? Uh, and these people are coming together to resolve maybe a functional issue with that function because it is not, uh, its output isn't being contained uh, within the control limits that were set with it by the resource bargain. Okay, thanks a lot yeah. for trying. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it is I, I, it is very difficult. I know that it's a sort of discussion we could have over a beer with a yes, pen. Yes, let's with, do that. <laughs> with with a pen, with a pen and a nice piece of paper. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, yeah. Can you stop Great. the screen sharing, Steve? Sorry, I'm going to stop now, John. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, pause, stop. There we are. There we are. Okay, okay. great. Okay. Um, we're a bit over time, but are there any last pressing questions before we close? Okay. Well, once again, Steve, thank you. That was fascinating and a, a great discussion. And um, I think it's been a really good talk. Thanks for that, John. Thanks, everybody. Okay. Angela, do you want to conclude? No, well, yeah, thanks, thanks, Paul. Very, very, very interesting. And uh, thank you very much. I think that. Uh, the topic is so complex that uh, we have um, enough to continue. And I, to could, I could imagine that, we, Angela. We could Thanks have gone on all night, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so thank yeah. you very much. Yeah. Okay, and the next seminar, Angela, the next webinar? The next one, is, we have a special guest. He's not a Metaforum uh, uh, person. His name is Alan Reiner. He's a um, biologist and uh, ex expert in complexity from Bath University. And he's, uh, he has developed a theory on, of um, a, that is called, he called natural, uh, natural inclu in inclusivity. And it is, uh, it is inspired in things like fungi and uh, the, the basis of life in networks. And uh, he's just challenging most of the, of the ideas about complexity that are nowadays um, current. Uh, he doesn't know very much stuff for work. He's just uh, beginning to know. But I just uh, come across him recently. Uh, we co supervised a PhD student in call, and um, I found uh, his, um, his theory really interesting. And uh, he's also an artist and a poet, so a really transdisciplinary person. Mm -hmm. So I invited him, and he's going to be just explaining to us his perspectives on, on complexity and life. So that's the next one, uh, the first day uh, in one month, the first weekend, the first week, uh, Wednesday of April. And then we have uh, Jose Perez Rios on the, uh, at the beginning of May, talking about his experience using the VSM. And then we have um, uh, Roger, um, Roger Doc and, uh, and Jean, uh, and Jane Searle, and they are going to be talking about them, their approach to BSM and um, very practical way of uh, in understanding the, the BSM by the end of May. And then after that, we have the, the Metaforum conference in Belgium. Uh, we, the, as we were saying at the beginning, the, the registration is still open and we are going to go ahead. And uh, we had um, lots of very interesting people coming. So that's uh, the 10th to the 12th of June. 
and then um, for the time being we are not um, well it's it, it not been confirmed the the second semester we are still organizing so if anyone's um, want to suggest uh, topics for the second semester we are uh, happy to consider and um, and that's that's all for the time being okay thank you angela okay well th th that's it for tonight guys so thanks very very much hopefully see you the next one cheers okay thanks bye bye, -bye. bye, -bye.